I'll admit it, sometimes all these sound bars leave me jaded. Some sound darn good, and some, well, flaming refuse, but they all share the same glaring limitation. All the front channels are stuck on a structure that is far too narrow for anything like optimal clarity and spatial effects. Does the Sony HT-A9, the subject of this video, rekindle my fire in the gadgety home theater arena by delivering a revolutionary non-soundbar soundbar sound? Well, if you stick around, you'll find out. Fair warning. Hey, what's up everybody? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I do aim for detailed reviews, but you know, let's have some fun with it. Up first, components and features. Sometimes when unboxing, how do I say this? I feel like I live on a farm. Skipping over the wires and literature, you'll find the control box or the general that cross-dresses as the Apple TV, being an all black plastic square with aggressively rounded edges. The top of the box is decidedly un-Apple with that gold Sony logo. The front houses a little scrolly display that gives you exactly the kind of feedback you would expect including source material, levels, and input. The display can be bright, dimmed, or turned off entirely. Thank goodness. The remote control sensor is in the front, so keep a line of sight if you are a remote person. If you're sitting, say, 15 feet away, have your squinty eyes handy. The side of the box, fan vents. The back, you'll find the ins and outs. The USB port is for updates only, so settle down. You have a LAN port for your rock-solid music streaming. There is an S-Center out that, if connected to a compatible TV, offloads some of the center channel duty to the TV speakers. This option always seems dubious, as the TV speaker quality tenor and capabilities just don't match the rest of the system. Quantity over quality is probably not the direction you want to go in this case. The remaining two ports are eARC and a single HDMI input. Yes, the box with eARC can manage lossless audio from your TV or projector. The HDMI input is particularly useful if you don't have an eARC TV, as it gives you a path to get lossless high quality audio into the system, bypassing your shameful eARC bereft TV. The control box is capable of 8K and 4K 120 Hertz pass through. It will also pass Dolby Vision and HLG. Whether your TV has the hardware to handle any of this is a different question. The A9 supports all the major audio formats, all the way up to Dolby True HD, so think Peak Atmos. Also, DTSX, DTSS's lossless 3D audio, and 8-channel LPCM, the lossless multi-channel signal your Apple TV and consoles output. If you're having trouble getting Atmos from your Apple TV, it's probably because your TV has plain old arc and is totally mishandling the LPCM signal. The control box deserves plaudits for its wireless connectivity chops. You can play high-res audio over Bluetooth with LDAC support, and unlike Aptex HD, the other high-res Bluetooth format, LDAC is supported by Samsung, but uh, not Apple, so... awkward. If you're way too good for Bluetooth, the A9 also supports Chromecast and AirPlay 2, which gives you more leash to roam and allows you to beam to multiple rooms in the house. Note, when beaming media to the control box, it will play only audio. The video stays on your phone. You'll need to beam to your TV for video. All right, so what about the four speakers, the Beatles of the A9? All four are tall gray cylinders with a little slice cut out in the back each speaker looks identical, though each is pre-assigned a general location which can be found on the bottom. These speakers are quite large if comparing them to soundbar rear speakers, but perhaps on the fit end if compared to traditional surround loudspeakers. It makes sense it falls somewhere in the middle as these speakers are attempting to be both, hopefully the best of both. These speakers look modern and sleek and they're proportioned to come across as statuesque. They definitely have a presence and look unique. Though, as you can see, these speakers do come in a neutral color to help them fade into your walls. They feel dense, and the weight is about what you would expect for the size. So they definitely don't physically communicate cheap piece of garbage. That is definitely a vibe in this everything in one cardboard box kit 
home theater space. The grill is metal with a trillion punctured circles that adorns the top and front half of the speaker. The rest of the speaker is a fine grain sandpaper textured plastic. Very unique, not in love with the feel, it's a bit hostile. The power port and sync buttons are on the bottom. The wire routing is a bit goofy, but workable. Mounting hardware is behind this little plate. You can use a typical screw mount or very casually hang it on a nail. So what's hiding inside the casing? Well, quite a bit, but let's discuss the noisemakers. On the front, we have two drivers, a 70 by 82 millimeter wide directivity woofer and a 19 millimeter soft dome tweeter. Now this goes without saying, but I can confirm that the baffle is beveled. If you're baffled by the bevel, here is my medium expertise explanation. The baffle is the panel that houses the front drivers, and one of its primary roles is to limit rear and front sound wave cancellation. The bevel makes the baffle more baffly. Beveled baffle edges. Now go tell your friends. The top of the speaker houses a 46 by 54 millimeter upward firing woofer that is angled such that if the four are perfectly aligned, you might get Captain Planet. Sony calls each woofer an X-balance speaker unit, which refers to its rectangular shape. The benefits are promoted as richer bass and less distortion due to savvier sound pressure management. This woofer design is proliferated throughout Sony's contemporary offering, including the HT-A7000. Anyway, if you're counting, the whole system is merely 12 drivers, far fewer than you will find from the likes of every other flagship soundbar system with rear speakers. While Sony advertises this system as something like a 7.1.4 or 12 channel system, it would classically be identified as a 4.1.4 with four forward and four height channels with a low frequency channel distributed amongst the four speakers. This system is more than generous with itself, even hinting at a dot one. The Q990B for reference, which I think is king of the soundbar systems, is an 11 dot real one dot four system with 22 drivers. Though I'm still in the mood to be wooed. So let's go 4.1.4, let's go get it. The truth though is, I don't think Sony really wants to talk about channels. This system is meant to create a sound bubble through incredibly sophisticated sound processing termed 360 degree sound mapping. So using advanced EQing and sound wave convergence to create an array of virtualized or phantom speakers. It's not meant to deliver prepackaged sounds from finite discrete locations. That would be boring. The remote? Just like Samsung, it takes on the company's global Sony form, if you will. Boxy, completely resistant to whatever influence Steve Jobs may have had on industrial design. Just about everything you would want to do with the bar is at the single button push level here. So it's quite useful if you're trying to make quick changes. You can also control the system with Sony's aggressively mediocre Music Center app, which is really optimized around getting content on a device. Adjusting sound is kind of an afterthought in the app as it's nested with settings alongside software updates, setting up Alexa, and learning about 360 reality audio. All right, the separate optional sub. Yes, I bought the 300 watt SASW5. I'll spare you my spiel as I already talked about the design and specs in my HTA7000 video. It's competent, not extraordinary. I hate to admit it, I agree with my arch nemesis, Avendrabu Robin Sabat on this one. Now in 2021, that's the only rule. If you're planning on buying just the A9 without Sony's best wireless sub, go jump in a lake. With all the proper precautions, of course. Setup. To get sound, it's a plug and play. But if you want to get the speakers calibrated, which is particularly important in a system like this, and connected to the matrix for AirPlay and Chromecast support, go to the ARC input on your TV and you'll be guided through a calibration process. If you add a sub at a later time, you will need to recalibrate. It's a small price to pay to make your expensive sound investment not sound silly. In terms of optimal speaker placement, 
Each comes with two microphones to calculate a sense of its location relative to the ceiling and other speakers. So you have some tolerance in how high you can place the speakers without losing performance. I tend to think getting the center of the speakers around the center point of the floor and ceiling is your best bet. Feel free to experiment, but really try to get as much space as you can between these speakers. It'll make a big difference. I would like to call out that this system was perhaps the least despair inducing during setup and general use of all the sound bars, maybe save Sonos. Um, no drama, which was very refreshing. Sound adjustments. In terms of manual adjustments, you're limited to volume, bass level, and rear level. So no manual EQing, you'll just f everything up, you rube. There are, however, several prepackaged solutions to explore. Night and Dialog. Both butcher the sound, but they do what they're intended to do. The three primary sound modes are Cinema for Immersion, Music for Gloss and Shine, and Standard if you're a basic or want something more raw, less processed, less spacious, less vertical. And it would not be a modern Sony audio offering if it did not include the immersive audio experience option that works to supercharge the height effect. How? Well, by increasing upward firing channel volume and heating up the tweeters to put more electricity in the air. Or something like that. Note music mode without immersion plays at 2.1, with immersion 4.1.4. So play around with that. I often think that 2.1 leads to better results for many tracks and mixes. What do you say? It's my privilege. Oh, you're gonna be a pirate. This is gonna love For one second, there's a BMW chasing us. Yeah. Thank you. There is nothing else I'd rather be doing with my life. I don't care. Uh -oh. What's driving going on? Let's fall in the day on green. Okay, the sound. Okay, folks, I'm just going to admit it. This system rekindled my flame. When firing up Underground 6 for the thousandth time, resuming to one of my many action scenes, I immediately got chills. This is a response that occurs when you experience something that's utterly surprising and categorically different. Here is my take on why it happened. The physical separation in the two front speakers makes the world you're attempting to inhabit much more expansive. Right behind me is a 150-inch projection screen. 
I placed the two front speakers about two feet beyond the edges. Rear speakers about the same distance apart. Anyway, for the first time in this listening space, I felt like I was in a legit movie theater in terms of spaciousness. The sound produced made the room and scene feel heartbeat pausing big. To the point of vulnerability. I think lots of bar systems are cinematic in terms of their ability to layer many tracks of sound, but perhaps the sound can feel a little cramped. With the A9, beyond the spaciousness, the raw sound coming out of each speaker is exceedingly clear, squeaky clean, very low distortion. Is it the most neutral sound? No. Is it a crazy sharp, high contrast image of the soundscape? Yes. I have to admit it, it could very well be that those X-Factor woofers and bedazzled waffled edges are maybe more than a marketing campaign. I'm gonna give Sony the W on those claims. So you get more space, top-notch clarity, and third, I want to say somewhere between inspired and brilliant audio processing to make the limited numbers of channels become something definitely more than the sum of the parts. With soundbar systems, the soundbar is the diva, the star, and largely the focal point. With the A9, no one component is the star, the spaciousness is the star, and the focal point is wherever the sound accent may be placed at any particular moment. One of the best ways to excite those arm hairs is to virtualize movement. The A9 speakers and the bass coordinate extraordinarily well in handoffs, accentuating the sensation of objects rushing in front of you, towards you, over you, the dynamics are top notch. Highlights from my brief history with the system, racing vehicle sounds in Mad Max, obviously, bullet whizzes, glass shattering, spacious sound in the frenetic club scene in John Wick, and the massive, sweeping, sparse, but deliciously detailed soundscapes in Dune. Music, I think a lot of what I said earlier still applies. Atmosphere, space, and cleanliness. It's a fine music machine. I truly enjoyed listening to Peace Like a River by Paul Simon, the intricate yet accessible guitar licks, bongos alternating between the two front speakers. All presented itself admirably with the A9. But what really allows the A9 to transform music into an experience is Dolby Atmos music. And I suggest playing it through HDMI like the Apple Music app via the Apple TV. This format with this system introduces something like an involuntary participation. As you are placed right in the middle of the stage, the sense of movement and sway is just totally different. Let's take Feel It Still by Portugal The Man as an exemplar. It uses the back speakers for the backbeat in the crunchy hand clappy section. I really want to say doing something like that is corny, but it was just so fun and participatory it almost forces you to move and sway positionally to where the action is. All sounding highly distinct, defined, and purposeful. Bottom line, the A9 is a legitimate thrill ride that feels really freaking fresh and really freaking the right way forward. Okay, I've drooled all over this system to the point of straining its IP rating, so let's add some nuance. As all the noisemakers are all wireless, it is not immune from the occasional dropout. It's not really bad, but if you stand next to a speaker long enough, you'll hear a blip or a momentary lapse that for some may be easily ignored, but for others may cause a blind rage return. Both fair. My typical criticism of Sony is that the EQ curve is exaggerated, too dismissive of the mids. Not well suited for those seeking natural or neutral sound or well-behaved grandchildren by the fire sound. I think that is still a factor here. As exciting and clear and spacious as the sound is, it's not particularly suited to do chill. Something you might want from a multi-thousand dollar sound equipment investment from time to time. This system is tuned to keep you on edge, as far as I can tell. All right, the Q990B or the A9. Why are you asking me? Hate to say it, but I think it's a toss up. But the fact that you can buy two Samsung Q990Bs for the price of one A9 and the sub ultimately makes me lean Q990B. I'll try to be more helpful. If you like everything I said about the A9, that is you value space, clarity, and thrills, I think the A9 is your boy. 
Now, if you like a crafted, full-bodied sound, adept at all forms of music, along with a healthy dose of competent Atmos, and a NASA-sized panel for shaping your sound, feel really good about your Q990B purchase. The A9 is the flashy rookie showing the league revolutionary manners of play. The Q990B is the nine-time MVP that continues to age gracefully. Thanks for sticking to the end. If you can, please comment, like, and subscribe as is fitting to the value this video may have offered. Wrapping this up, catch you on the next one.